Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm a vegan life and wellness coach. And today I'm joined by Hope Ware. And she's going to tell us a little bit about herself, why she went vegan, and uh, more. So thank you so much for joining me today, Hope. Thank you so much for having me, Morgan. So I started off uh, my professional life uh, with a degree in radio and television broadcasting. I worked in radio for a number of years. And then after having children, I did freelance voiceover projects. I'm a writer, a public speaker, and I have a website called underthemedian.com where I talk about the fact that my husband and I have raised our four boys debt-free on an income which was consistently under the national U.S. median income, including paying cash for our current home. So that's like, I guess that's my claim to fame. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. You definitely have tackled a lot and to have that many boys that you're, you're feeding on a, on a budget, right? Yes. That's got to be the hardest thing. And they're age 23 to 12 now. So they're not like little boys anymore. They eat yeah. man-sized portions of food. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine it. <laughs> so tell me what your life was like before you went vegan. Before I went vegan, I was 20 pounds heavier. I had almost constant acid reflex. Literally, I would lay in bed at night and think, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> and... Um, and, and I felt bloated all the time. And I just felt old. And I was not old. Um, when I became vegan, I was 45 years old. And so I thought, I should not be having all these difficulties at my age. This just should not, this is not right. Yeah, yeah. Well, even for, for me, I went vegan at 21. And I was having a lot of the things that you're talking about. And I remember thinking like, is this really just getting older? I'm 21, yeah. right? Like, is it all going downhill from here? <laughs> so it's, it's definitely powerful to, to know that you can like take control and, and get it back. So and that um, is it. And I had a huge like incentive for taking control. So for one thing, my father died at the age of 47, just before my 18th birthday. He died of a massive coronary heart attack, literally. Mm -hmm. In this world, one minute, in the next, the minute, the next minute. Wow. It was, that was it. That's how fast it was. And his arteries were completely clogged. And so when I got close to that age, I was 45, I started really looking at the link between what we eat and heart disease. It was important to me because I still had young children. Yeah. I had my first child at 32, my last at 43 and a half. Wow. And so, yes. <laughs> so I had a one and a half year old and I thought I better figure out how to fix this now because mm -hmm. I want to be around to see this child reach adulthood. And so that's when I started looking and we were kind of already on this trajectory. So when I was about 35, about three or four years after I got married, I was having the constant, like, mind-bendingly horrible acid reflux at night. And I thought, all right, it has to be something I'm eating. So we really started tweaking our diet, making some changes. We weren't spending much on food, but we were buying, like, crap. <laughs> we were eating badly. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, so we're just going to start eating better. So the eating better became, all right, eating more fruits and vegetables. We were still eating meat. We were still eating dairy, but we were eating like better, more yeah. homemade, more stuff that I knew what was in it. And then as time went along, I'm like, you know, I think we can do without meat one or two nights a week. And that's how it started. Mm -hmm. So we start on this path. And by the time I was 45, when I really decided this is it, man, I'm making a super big change here we were only eating meat three or four nights a week. Yeah. Wow. And I was like, Larry, mm, you know, maybe we just need to ditch this whole meat thing altogether. And that was when forks over knives came out. Oh, yeah. And that documentary really, it changed my life. Yeah. It's a, it's a great one for sure. It, it was like the light bulb moment. It was like something came on and I went, Oh, I get it. And it was like that missing link. Yeah. And I think this is such a journey that you kind of start into it and you keep sort of reading, you keep researching, you keep watching. And 
and you start putting all of these, you know, clues together in a row. And all of a sudden you go, oh, I got it. This is like the linchpin. This is what I really need to do. Yeah. And my sister, who was two years older than I, so she was 47. She was my dad's age when he died. Mm. I called her and I'm like, you got to watch this documentary. <laughs> and she's like, okay, I'm in, I'm, I'm going to watch it. And she watched, she called me back like a week later. She's like, I am in. And this woman has nerves. She has nerves of steel. <laughs> and when she's in, she is all in. And so that was really helpful for me to have a oh. sibling who was like, I mean, she's calling me going, so how's that dairy addiction going? How, you know, and she was like my counterpoint the whole time through this sort of keeping me on track and helping me to move forward and keep those steps going in the right direction. And so both of us, like we took off massive amounts of weight between the two of us and her blood pressure, which was elevated, dropped like a rock yeah. to exactly where it should be. I mean, she still has blood tests to this day. So I'm 55, she's 57. And, um, she has blood tests and, and her blood profile is that of a, of a woman half her age. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting because we were told like this normal, but this normal is clouded by like what we're eating and what we're doing. And I know for, for me, um, whenever I've had blood work done, right, I'm on the low end of normal, mm -hmm. but for my age and my activity and what I eat, it makes sense. Yeah. But for some people, like you'd never see numbers like that. Uh, the thing that changed um, like within just a few months was the fact that I had always, and I mean, always been anemic, slightly anemic, like mm -hmm. all of my life. Mm -hmm. And so we are told that to get iron, you have to eat meat, right? Yeah. And so for me to make this change and say, I'm done with meat. Um, it almost seemed a little dicey to me. I'm like, well, what's going to happen to my iron level? Yeah. And yeah. the longer that I was a vegan, the higher my iron level went. Yes. Which was the exact opposite of what I thought would happen. I got the first, the next blood test back and I was like, oh, I'm at the really, really low end of normal. And for me, that was like life changing that all of a sudden I had iron levels. They were even remotely in the normal range. And I thought, this is weird. This is not what I expected to see. And yeah. so each subsequent yearly blood test came back with higher iron levels. And now it is right smack dab in the middle of the normal range. So I'm at a party one night and I get to talking to this registered nurse who mm -hmm. works, you know, like with dietetics and things like that. And um, she starts asking about my plate of food, <laughs> okay. which clearly has no meat on it <laughs> mm -hmm. and no cheese on it. And she's like, are you vegan? I said, yes, I am. She's like, I could tell. And um, she's like, so tell me about this decision. Tell me about like, you know, what's this look like, you know, with like your blood profile and stuff. Lord knows why she asked me about that. But, you yeah. know, well, I'll talk to strangers mm -hmm. and party about anything. And... <laughs> And so I just mentioned to her, I said, you know, it's really weird because I'm like, all of a sudden I realize I'm, a, I'm with somebody who can maybe give me some answers. And I'm like, I'm noticing that my iron level, which was always slightly anemic is now normal. And she goes, really? Hmm. She said, like, tell me what you eat. And so I start describing to her what I eat. She goes, no, wait, I have a really important question. How many greens do you eat? And I looked at her, I said, copious amounts. <laughs> She's like, yeah. okay, explain that. I'm like, I eat two huge salads a day. And I, I really do. Mm -hmm. And I said, my serving bowl is the size of a serving bowl. My salad is in what normal people pass at the table as a serving bowl. That is my salad bowl. And she's like, mystery solved. <laughs> It is because of the amount of greens that you eat that your iron level has consistently gone up. I'm like, oh, go figure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you when you come to, to veganism or plant-based eating, you, you increase that. But you also get rid of dairy. And dairy can, can block absorption of iron. 
right? And it's, it's something that for children, when, when that happens, if they have low iron, they tell you to take dairy out. So yeah. if they, they say that for children, right? Like it's got to be a factor for adults. And so many vegetarians seem to be lacking iron and vegans have the opposite. So it's, it's interesting to see uh, some of the new information come out and uh, stereotypes and beliefs start to shift and change. What's interesting is if you look at a chart that shows like um, different um, ways that you can get calcium, mm -hmm. like five of the top 10 or six of the top 10 aren't dairy. No. They're plant-based. Yes, yes. And, and so people don't realize that. And I think that's the huge thing. People reiterate what they've been told. Yeah. They don't know actually how this whole thing works. Because that's a huge thing with people. People start looking at you going, so tell me how this whole thing works. Because yeah. mainly because they're convinced that it doesn't and that it can't possibly be as easy <laughs> as changing what you eat. That yeah. your whole life could possibly be changed by what you put in your mouth is like, they're like, mm, yeah, I don't get it. Even doctors don't, don't get it. And I'm, I'm lucky to have a really supportive uh, doctor, but he admits he knows nothing about veganism. But, you know, he's really supportive of it. And something he said is that he has never seen a vegan come in with deficiencies, that we're much more aware of what we're doing and we're more purposeful. And it's normally that the people that are on other diets that maybe they avoid red meat or they just cut out food groups without really thinking about what they're doing. And they're the ones that come in and end up deficient because there's not that thought and that planning in it. Interesting, like, because most doctors, they have an MD degree, right? They mm -hmm. don't have a degree in dietetics or yeah. anything like that. And uh, so I was on blood pressure medication for years. And I finally asked my doctor, I said, tell me how to get off this stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what, if you lost 10 pounds, you probably could get off of it. I'm like, why did you not tell me that? Seriously? Yeah. Why did you not tell me that five years ago? Yeah. Well, I think so many people, you know, in, in the healthcare field in general, think that people mm -hmm. don't want to change their lifestyle. So there's some that don't know it, but the ones that know it think it's too big for people, right? And, and mm -hmm. it's easier for them to take a pill and just continue on with their life. Well, people want a silver bullet, right? Yeah. And some people look at being vegan as a silver bullet. I think vegans do too. We're like, oh, silver bullet, protected against everything. But my blood pressure, even being vegan, did not drop until I added exercise into the mm. equation. Yeah. Walking three to five miles a day, it drops like a rock to normal levels. Wow. And so I... You know, even people may even try this and say, well, it's not working. Well, it's not that it's not working. Everybody's body, everybody's metabolisms, everybody's DNA is different. We are individuals. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's a matter of it not working. I think it's a matter of figuring out the combination that you need. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, vegan diets or plant-based diets, they're, they're not equal. They can look so different, whether you follow a diet that's like what they prescribe on forks over knives, which is no oil and low in fat, mm -hmm. or, you know, your high in processed alternatives and Oreos, right? So right. It, can, it can look completely different. It doesn't equal healthy. And interestingly, because my sister and I clearly share the same DNA, right? Mm -hmm. For her, all she did literally was change what she ate and her blood pressure dropped like a rock. Wow. For yeah. me, it didn't happen. I'm like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> we share the same gene pool. <laughs> Why is this not happening? For me, it was different. So even if you have someone in your family that is also vegan, that doesn't mean that combination is the same for you as it is for them. You have, yeah. to, keep, you have to keep looking. You have to keep researching. You have to keep figuring out what it is that your body needs that you can give it. Now, once you do that, I do think that, your, your numbers change, but yeah. it's not going to be the same as everybody else's. A hundred, a hundred percent. And I think it's, it's really interesting. A lot of the time I see on, on Facebook groups, there'll be couples and uh, you know, the husband's thriving. He's doing great. He's feeling good. He's dropping pounds. And the wife is there like, 
I haven't lost anything and I'm bloated and <laughs> you know, it is, they're eating the exact same thing, but their bodies are just reacting differently to the transition. So it's a, uh, it's a different process for, for everybody. And some people make a switch really easy and see results right away. And some people it takes a little bit longer. And I will say for me, like I did drop 20 pounds. Yeah. I dropped that 20 pounds and uh, my skin is clearer and I probably look better at 55 than I did at 45. <laughs> I've seen pictures. <laughs> I've looked back at pictures, but ooh, I didn't look so good. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think you look great. I would not have, oh, have pegged you at uh, 55. So um, it's a testament to the, the vegan diet, at least a whole foods one. Yeah. So, and I do have to combine really that whole idea of low fat, low salt, Mm -hmm. low sugar. We really, and it, so I still have all four boys at home, even though two of them are raised, they, they're still hanging out with us. And um, like, we try to really reserve anything with sugar in it for weekends. Okay. Yeah. We make something sweet on the weekend, but other than that, it's like fruit for dessert. Yeah. And so you have to kind of tweak that too. You have to look at your sugar consumption and go, well, you know, I'm not losing weight, but maybe it's all that sugar <laughs> or maybe it's all that oil or maybe it's too much fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oil, I think is a big one and fat. Like I've worked with some women and they're telling me how they're eating so healthy. And I, I know I had this idea, right? I'm eating so healthy. I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat and I'm not feeling good. I'm not losing weight. And you look at the balance and it, it, there's a lot of oil and there's a lot of, um, you know, lean meats and eggs, right? And we, we go towards those initially because we think that they're so good for us and it's not really pushing it. And, uh, you know, sometimes we snack on nuts and if you eat a whole bag of nuts, you're going to have a, you're going to gain weight, right? There's, they're so calorie dense. So exactly. It's calorie huge. density is huge. Yes. So, you know, and especially as you get older, you get past 50 and you begin really looking at what you need to like keep that heart healthy. And so one of the most important things you can do if you want heart health is eat those greens. I yeah. mean, cook them down and eat handfuls of them every day. <laughs> um, because, because what it does is it relaxes blood vessels and it lowers blood pressure yeah. naturally. Well, and I think a, a lot of people, there's a lot of people that are scared of green food. And it's, it's kind of like this, you, your taste buds get away, right? And you, you don't have that experience. So the idea of like eating big bowls of salad or eating spinach, it's overwhelming, but you, your taste buds start to change. And if you don't love it, you can hide it, right? Like smoothies are a great way to hide spinach. There's so many different things that you can do to, you know, or, or like you said, cooking it down, throwing it in a stir fry full of spinach and it looks really tiny. You don't even know it's there. Or throw it in soup at the end. That's what I always tell people. Mm, yeah. If you want to eat greens, throw a handful or two in right at the end of the cooking time. You don't even have to have, you can take it off the heat. Just stop the heat, throw the greens in and put the lid back on for five minutes. It just steams it down to nothing. You don't even have to cook it in the soup. Just literally throw it in when it's hot before you serve it. And those greens will be perfect. Mm, that's a good tip. I, I'm lucky. I, I, I like my greens and I, I always have, I like kale and spinach and all those really dark leafy vegetables. So I don't have to hide them, thankfully. Well, it is. And you know, the first time, like I tried arugula, I was like, this stuff is vile. I mean, seriously, <laughs> I, I hated it hands down. I'm like, who eats this stuff? Mm -hmm. But I kept incorporating it into salads a little bit at a time because it, um, Bitter, deep greens are really important for you. They have each green, because you think of greens as all being the same, right? A green is a green is a green. Not so. Yeah. The nutritional profile of each of them is different. And so if you will continue, and it's like when we try to get our kids to try something new, right? It's like, yeah. we all know as parents, it's going to take at least a half a dozen times. Am I yeah. right? And you just keep like making it a different way and putting it in a different way. And all of a sudden they're like, Hey, that green stuff's not so bad. It's the same for adults. Yeah. And after a while I knew, I knew that my taste buds had adapted when in the middle of a winter, all, so, all of a sudden I thought, what am I craving? I'm craving something. I went, oh, I'm craving arugula. Really? <laughs> and when that happened, I was like, 
this is it. I'm in. I am arugula girl now. <laughs> and, and I love it now. And it's the same thing with my sister because we did not grow up. So we are children of the 60s, right? We were both born in the 60s. And in the 1960s, it was canned vegetable season, like in every home. Okay. Unless you had a garden, which sometimes you did. So you would have like some fresh veggies then, or your mom would can it or whatever. But canned foods were like, they were the newest convenience. Mm. And, um, and so you really didn't understand a lot of times what the difference was between canned and fresh. Now, the canned vegetables at the height of, of their flavor, right? But they put a lot of sodium in there, and that's part mm. of the problem with canned vegetables. And I did not even know frozen vegetables existed. I'm not joking. <laughs> And uh, I had never tasted broccoli or cauliflower until I was an adult. Now, I mean, it's nothing against my mom because all moms in the 1960s and early 70s cooked that way. That's, that's what you, you made casseroles and jello salads. That's just the way it was. <laughs> yeah. you know? And a big hunk of meat with a side of a little piece of bread. I, this just, that was life back then. Um, so she wouldn't do anything wrong or anything different than any other mom was doing. But when you've been raised that way, it is a little bit of a challenge for mm -hmm. those of us who were raised that way to make this leap and say, I'm willing to try whatever is grown in the earth or on a tree, I'm in. Okay. Um, but I trust me, if you're over 50 and you're watching this, give it a go and keep trying new things because your taste buds do adapt. And pretty soon you too will be craving arugula in the middle of winter. <laughs> That's a, that's, yeah. I mean, I, I crave kale, right? Like it's, yeah. it's such a weird thing. And even my husband now, wait, will we buy kale? And he's in there and he's taking my kale and I'm like, stop. Don't touch my kale. That's my kale, right? Get more kale next time. What are you doing? So <laughs> yeah, things just start to, to change and shift, but we, we do inherit what, what our families uh, and our parents, right? Those meals that we cook we bring those with us most often and we inherit that. And for, for me, like our family meals was uh, shake and bake chicken, soggy rice and like soggy watery broccoli. And that's what we ate. And so I know when I pictured going vegan and I pictured just like taking out of the chicken and like the yummy breading and I'm like, Ooh, right. <laughs> It's just not, it's, it's not a good time to just remove and, and not add it and spice things up. So yeah, so that's another tip. I think one of the tips is definitely to find vegan versions of those American comfort foods that you really like because they exist. Yes. Um, I will tell you that my 15 year old son is my sous chef. We oh, are yeah. constantly in the kitchen together creating new things and mm -hmm. striving to find those flavor combinations that were like, oh, that is perfect. And so you need to not, this is not a life of depravity. It yeah. truly, truly is not. Yeah. And I, I think that's such a, it's such a common perception is that you're, you're going vegan and you're giving up a lot, but you're, you're yeah. not really giving up anything other than the concept of what your meals should look like. And you're, you're opening up all these new possibilities. Well, I know, because we chatted a little bit ahead of time. There are two things we really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. We want to talk about, is this expensive, this whole vegan thing? Yeah. And I think a little bit, because I still have four boys at home, what, what is this whole thing like when you are a parent and you are trying to get your kids to eat something green? <laughs> Yes. So um, the, the fr answer to the first question is absolutely not. This is not expensive. Mm -hmm. That is like, that is so huge to me for families to know you do not, with a capital N-O-T, spend an arm and a leg at the grocery store when you are vegan. Yeah. Can you? Yes. <laughs> do you need to? No. <laughs> yes. Yes. So the whole idea of not spending an arm and a leg is avoiding like processed foods. If yeah. you buy processed foods, yes, you are going to spend a lot of money at the grocery store. If you will avoid that and really focus on producing things from your kitchen that are made from single ingredient foods, then you are going to save a boatload of money. My yeah. grocery budget for all six of us, and remember my boys are 23 to 12, 
is $375 a month. Yeah, that's, and that's amazing for and no a one that size. <laughs> no one goes hungry in my house. Um, but there are ways you can do it. So I, let me just give, if, if, you're th- if you're thinking, I really need to do this on a budget. All right. Yeah. So you need to shop local and shop seasonal. Shop mm-hmm. those farmers markets because those farmers, not only have they grown it most of the time, they know exactly how to tell you to store it, to make sure that it lasts as long as possible. They know how to tell you to cook it. So Mm. they are just a huge way to get information about how to use those products. And uh, the second tip is uh, shop those supermarket markdowns in the produce department. Yeah. A lot of major grocery store chains, you can walk in, call the store and ask, when do you do your daily markdowns in produce? And don't, don't talk to the person who answers the phone. Say, could I speak with somebody in the produce department? Yeah. Sometimes the person at the like, like the call desk, the help desk, courtesy desk, that's what it is, um, doesn't know when they really do the markdowns. But the mm-hmm. people who the produce, they do. Yeah. And then you're going to try to time your visit near that time of the day, and you will find a boatload of markdowns in the produce section. And a lot of times they will mark down 40 to 50%. Yeah. And I think something that people... When they think markdowns, they think bad food. And it's not necessarily that the food's going bad. It's that they have other food that needs to, it's fresher and it needs to fill that spot. And I mean, it depends on the store, right? Some stores have amazing produce in those markdown sections and some of them don't move it until it's going bad. (laughs) Yes. So you got to know your store, Mm -hmm. you know, figure out who, you know, marks that produce down before it's really looking like slimy. (laughs) And you don't yes. want to eat it because yes. um, a lot of them do and and they they mark it down aggressively um, 48 hours before even the sell by date they will start marking produce down yeah so look for that uh, another way to really support local small family owned farms is to join a CSA that's community supported agriculture oh, okay. we've been CSA members for well over a decade and so what you do is you pay a membership price at the first of the year, you pay it all up front and mm-hmm. the farmers use that to get some seeds, to get supplies, to get going on the planting season. And then every single week throughout the growing season, you go to a designated pickup site on a designated pickup day mm-hmm. and you pick up a bushel of fresh picked produce every week during the growing season. Now for us, we're in the central Illinois region of the United States. And so for us, it's like 25 weeks out of the year. Yeah. Wow. And so we paid for our CSA way back in January. And now we are getting a bushel of fried produce every single week. And I am planning my weekly menu around that produce that comes every week now for the next 25 weeks. Wow. And it, it's a fantastic way to shop. Not only that, you can kind of look at what comes in your bushel basket. And a lot of times they're set up at the same farmer's market that you're picking up from. And you can say, oh, look, I'm going to need more broccoli than this. And you can shop <laughs> at the same vendor, yeah. at, you know, to sort of fill in the gaps of whatever was not in your, your produce box for that yeah. week. Um, so the other thing you can do is look for bulk deals. So mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the last, like, I think it's the last <laughs> <laughs> suggestion I have for feeding a family on a budget. Um, look for bulk deals. Yeah. Don't be afraid to shop. Um, we have a local ethnic market in town called the Mediterranean mm-hmm. Mart, my very favorite place to shop. And the owner there gets produce fresh from the Chicago markets every Thursday. And so I will walk in, he'll say, Hey, you want a case of this stuff? I'm like, how much for a case of this? I just bought an entire case, which by the way, it was 75 Kusa squash. Okay. The Kusa yeah. squash is a small Mediterranean squash that traditionally you core out the inside and you stuff it with rice and spices, and then you cook it in a spicy tomato sauce. It is divine. Sounds divine. But when I hesitated, he said, you can freeze it. I'm like, for real? 
He's like, I will ask my wife. She will, I will make sure she messages you and tells you how to properly freeze it so you can eat it months down the road when you really want yourself a stuffed kusa squash. I'm like, deal. So I paid like 33 cents per squash was wow. what I paid. Yeah. And remember, six of those will feed my family. So the whole goal is to feed your entire family for under five bucks for a meal. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Freezing that is like a whole, a whole new ball game. It was like life changing. <laughs> so you got to know how much you're going to use and you have to know, can I preserve this for later use? And if you can go for it. Yeah. Well, those were some, some amazing tips. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what a, a typical day of eating looks like for you? We always start. So our family has always rotated between cream of wheat and oatmeal. Now my husband and I, not super big cream of wheat fans. The kids love it though. So we actually eat oatmeal every morning. <laughs> and um, I throw some fruit on there and a drizzle of almond milk. I'm a little picky. My almond milk needs to be unsweetened. <laughs> yeah, I like unsweetened too. No vanilla in my almond milk. It's gotta be just regular almond milk. <laughs> drizzle of that, a little bit of maple syrup, real maple syrup, please, no high fructose corn syrup. And, and oh, Aunt Jemima? Yep, yeah, no, oh, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I am on my way for about four hours. In the afternoon, we have nearly always done homemade soup. So if you're going to feed a family for not a lot of money, you're going to be making soup a couple of times a week. And uh, so we just vary between, you know, we have probably half a dozen favorites, and then I throw some new things in there once in a while to see. Are we things up? Yeah. Like, this is me. I'm a new family favorite, but soup is a, is a really great way to feed, feed a family for not much money. So we usually do that. Um, right now, since the COVID lockdown, I started making homemade bread again. Okay. For years, when my older boys were younger, I baked all of our bread from scratch. And so when we went to lockdown, I was like, I'm going to start baking bread again. Well, now they really like it. <laughs> And they're like, we really want you to keep doing this, please, pretty please. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, bowl of soup, a big chunk of homemade bread, maybe um, with some tuna salad, which is some vegan. It's not tuna salad, it's chickpea salad mm -hmm. on top of that. And that is like glorious. Um, and then for supper, we just really seriously vary with supper. Uh, the kids all like just various kinds of bean burgers. We might do that. We usually do a baked potato bar once a week where I just bake a boatload of, um, of just baking potatoes. And, and I put out probably, you know, dozen different kinds of toppings, little mm -hmm. this flat that's left over, and you can throw it on top of a baked potato. We do that at least once a week. I like to cook lentils and then um, just add some, um, some taco seasoning to it. Yeah. A taco filling and we have taco salad maybe once a week. So we do have those like favorite things we do. I base everything around, around produce though, and then throw in yeah. some beef. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, it's definitely a good way to do it, right? You're getting so much variety that way, basing it around your produce and you're making sure you're not wasting it. Right. I know. That is a huge thing for me. Yeah. Our family goal is no more than 3% food waste. Wow. That's, yeah. that's a good one. Um, and I think you get so caught up, right? I, with you buy this fresh stuff and you don't plan for it and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm going to use it. It's there. And by the time you think of it, it's all wilted in your bottom drawer right. and you're, you're tossing it out. So you have to know what you have on hand. Yeah. That's another tip is just to make sure you keep a running list. Know what you have in your refrigerator. Know what you have in your freezer. Know what you have in your pantry. Um, use those, those planning sheets to, to figure out what you're going to make. M weekly meal planning, huge, huge. Uh, okay. Bulk cooking days, also very, very big to feed a family for not very much money. I do all of these things. Yeah, yeah. We do, we do bulk cooking for my husband's lunches because it's mm -hmm. easiest for him to, to take them and go and you know, we, and we switch it up once in a while. He went through a big uh, tofu and rice and veggie phase. And, uh, you know, the guys are at work with their chicken breast and their, their vegetables trying to keep the keto diet going. And my husband's just pounded in the rice and they're like, you know, what's going on? How come you're not ballooning up? <laughs> what's so funny is when they look at you and say, are you going to eat all that? <laughs> 
like, yes, yes, I am. I've gotten that comment so many times when I go places and I have like a, my big salad with me and they're mm-hmm. like, are you going to eat all that? I'm like, yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't believe in, in portion sizes. <laughs> yeah. And I never, I never count calories. I don't know if you do, but no. the only thing I really have to make sure a little bit is, um, is I have to watch fat content just a little bit. Otherwise I'll start to pack on the pounds. Mm-hmm. Peanut butter is actually really my nemesis. Um, it was sent to test me in my life um, <laughs> because I just, I, I really have to honestly try to avoid it. So mm-hmm. that's my big thing is to figure out like if something really is bothering you, let's say you find out peanut butter is, um, I, I really don't believe this is a life of depravity. So you figure out what is it that I'm really like wanting in that peanut butter. And yeah. for me, it is a quick and easy topping. I mean, I got to have something quick and easy for lunch. It yeah. can't take forever in a day. And so I have to plan ahead and say, I'm going to make a huge batch of chickpea salad because that's what's going to go on top of my sandwich. Or yeah. I make a couple of different kinds of hummus. Hummus, oh, it's amazing. And it's so quick and easy to make. And you can make two or three different flavors of hummus and you can switch it up throughout the week. I put yeah. a different kind of hummus on your bread every day or flatbread. You make flatbread so easy too. And yeah. so it's just a matter of really thinking ahead and figuring out, wait a minute, what is it that's triggering me and yeah. how do I avoid that trigger? Yeah. So a uh, big question here, where do you get your protein? That is so the most asked question. Honestly, it is. It is. Um, <laughs> because so there's the answer to that is that I have actually periodically um, tracked my protein intake just Mm -hmm. because I wanted to prove to myself, I know you can get (laughs) adequate protein from a plant-based diet, but I wanted to like prove it to myself. So I figured out, I like did the mathematical equation, Mm -hmm. um, how many, you know, grams of protein I needed every day. And I, I tracked it over a period of several weeks. I'm like, by golly, I am getting enough protein. Thank you very much. Yes. And so as long as you were eating a varied diet, mm-hmm. you're probably getting enough protein. But if you really want to know, it is so easy to use one of those apps and track it. Honestly, it didn't take me very much time to input what I was eating and, yeah. um, and how much of it I was eating. And I discovered in a hurry. I really was getting enough protein. I think protein combining is also another, like, it's such a misnomer. Um, yeah. So this whole idea of protein uh, combining combining was um, was actually written in a book in the 1960s. Oh. It was called Diet for a Small Planet. And so that lady was the one who initially said, oh, I think vegans need to, to combine proteins in order to get complete proteins. Yeah. And somehow, <laughs> for some reason, who knows why, it stuck. Mm-hmm. And since then, it has been actually disproven. It's been debunked, but people don't know that. Yeah. So the, the truth is, yes, most plants do not have complete proteins. But the great thing about our body is it's really, really smart. <laughs> and as long as you are eating a variety of plant-based foods mm-hmm. and you are eating a rainbow, look at the colors on your plate a rainbow every day, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the other thing that comes in is eating enough, right? As long as you're yeah. eating enough calories and you're, you're having a variety, you're going to meet those requirements easily. Um, a big thing that, that's kind of brought this more forward was the Game Changers. It's a documentary yes. on Netflix. And so if, if anybody's watching this and they're worried about their protein and maybe you work out and you're worried about your fitness and you're, you're not being able to reach your goals, I would check that out because it completely smashes that stereotype. That's a great movie. I really liked it. Yes. <clears throat> and I know uh, when we were talking before, you were saying that your, your husband is, is really active, right? And, and you're active as well. Tell, tell me more about what you guys do on your, your day-to-day. Okay. So my husband, actually, it is a blessing from God that he is active at all. Because two years ago, he was feeling kind of tired. He had a cough that wouldn't go away. We didn't know what was wrong with him. He goes to the doctor and we find out he has heart failure, which is a shock given the fact that we are vegan, right? And I'm like, oh, holy cow, what I do wrong? Yeah. 
And the doctor said, it's, it's a virus has attacked his heart. And thank God we went when we did because his heart, his ejection fraction, if you know anything about ejection fractions, uh, was a 10 and barely a ton. So normal is 50 to 65. Okay. I, I don't know too much about it. But. So basically, um, his heart was barely functioning. <laughs> That's the way to put it. And he had a marble-sized blood clot in the bl bottom of one ventricle. Mm. And so he heads to the hospital, and they began, I mean, it was shocking to me. And they said, we really need to check to see if there are any blockages. Mm -hmm. And I looked them in the eye, and mm. I said this with the utmost confidence. If you find any blockages, I will hang up my vegan hat. Yeah. And I meant it. And so they were able to do the test and they came back in the room and said, your husband has zero blockages. Wow. He's 60 years old with yeah. zero blockages. What did, what did they think about that? Was that surprising to them? They were surprising. And they looked at me and I said, whole food, plant-based, vegan. And they went, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and so um, he has consistently since that time, 24 months ago, shocked the doctors. Mm-hmm. Because the minute the medication started helping his heart to function a little better, he was back on his bicycle. And he kept calling his, um, his heart doctor and saying, um, okay, so I'm riding five miles a day. Is there any way we could up that a little bit? And the cardiologist was like, you're feeling real tired when you get done? Are you out of breath? He goes, nope. And he was like, okay, you can go seven. And we kept like, every time we went in, we were like, okay, so we're up to 15 miles. Can we? And the, doctor, the cardiologist finally threw up his hands and said, ride as far as you want, Mr. Bear. <laughs> um, because this was so unusual for someone who is, was as sick as he was mm -hmm. to be able to get on a bicycle at all. For someone with an ejection fraction of 10, it was amazing he could walk across the floor. Yeah. And so he has continued to, to surprise uh, the, the cardiologist. We're down to seeing the cardiologist once a year. The last time he went in was the first time in 24 months that his cardiologist has not uttered the word heart transplant wow. during the visit. Yeah. So, you know, what the future is, none of us knows. I mean, let's face it. Yeah. But do I believe in my heart that a vegan lifestyle helped save his life, you betcha. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what his heart would have done had he had any blockages. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and it's so, it's so powerful that you were able to, to learn all these lessons, right? To see what happened to your dad and, and be able to pull your sister and your family in and, and really change your lives. It has been an incredible blessing. It's been a journey. I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah. you know, the siren call of cheese. Yes. Like, every once in a while, it still like rears its ugly head. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm smart enough now to go, okay, what is going on in my life <laughs> that, you know, I'm really upset and feel like I got to have some cheese <laughs> because it's, eating is emotional, right? Yeah. It's not just, <clears throat> it is emotional. And so a lot of times I would just sort of evaluate what am I feeling and why am I feeling this way and what is really going to fill that need that is not destructive to my life. Yeah. So would, would you say cheese was the, the hardest part about going vegan? Oh, without a doubt. I gave up meat in a heartbeat. <laughs> but yeah. giving up cheese was so painful. <laughs> It's, it's, I think it's the big one for most people yeah. that they, they just can't imagine giving it up, but it gets easier, right? Once you, you get away from it, it gets so much easier. And if you ever like backslide for lack of a better word and think, I'm just going to have a little nibble. It tastes so weird now. I'm like, why did I like this stuff? It's like wax. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I've had uh, every now and then, you know, you, you just get something and you don't realize that it had dairy or, or butter or something in it. And I, I had like a, a stir fry and it had butter in it. And I remember biting it and thinking it tasted rancid and like, what yeah. was wrong with it? And I, I gave it to my husband and he's like, that's just butter. And I went, oh, right. It, you're just, your taste buds change. 
and it, it won't be the same as you imagine it. And that's the thing too. I guess that's another tip I would have for people would be um, if you find it difficult to switch to vegan food thinking, oh my Lord, this is, this is so boring. Yeah. Then you, my friend, need to really look at things like flavored vinegars. Mm. You need to look at your spice rack. If your spice rack has like five spices in it, then you are in for a whole new world of treat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because there are so many herbs and spices that will change your life. Yeah. Vegan food is not boring. Not, not at all. Not tasteless. And I don't cook with salt because remember, even after I went vegan, I was on the edge of hypertensive and my husband having heart failure, definitely salt does not exist really in our house. Yes. And so I am using all kinds of stuff to provide that splash of flavor without adding salt. Yeah. And it is totally possible. I, and I've, I've done salt free and you don't even have to, they make um, like pre-combined seasoning, right? That has no salt. Uh, Mrs. Dash, I think is a brand, but you know, if you're new to it and you're like, well, I don't know how to season anything, you, you can find them pre-combined, like, you know, Greek, whatever, and, and use that to kind of incorporate more in your meals. You know, if you want something to taste like it has salt in it, put a splash of fresh lemon juice over the top. Hmm. That's a, a lot of those no salt blends. That's what they add to it is a little bit of cit, uh, citrus and it will mimic the flavor of salt without, and that, that feel in your mm -hmm. mouth without actually adding salt. Oh, that's a great tip. Well, I'll have to try that one. So is there anything that you would tell somebody if they're considering veganism, maybe they're on the fence, what, what would you tell them? Okay, so first of all, don't try to do everything at once. We all tend to be all or nothing people, right? And sometimes we don't even start because we're afraid we're gonna fail. Yeah. There's no pass or fail here. This is not a classroom. What this is, is a change that will enable you to feel better and live longer, right? And so sometimes there are baby steps involved in that. This is a journey. The mm -hmm. other thing you have to remember with veganism is it, it is not just affecting like your weight. It is affecting mm -hmm. how you feel. It is affecting how you treat yourself. It is affecting everything in your life. This is a lifestyle. I hate it when people call it a vegan diet. This yeah. is a lifestyle and it incorporates every part of you mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually that will change over time because you are changing the way that you treat your body. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just be having that exposure and that awareness to, to all these new things, it creates a shift in you. It does. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I think it's, it's, it's growth. Right. Yeah. And I think as humans, we all want to grow and, and get there and we feel fulfilled when we're doing that. So uh, veganism is a great first step. And it, like you said, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can start in stages. Yeah. And you are not too old to change. You yes. Are not. If you're plus 50, I'm right there with you and you can change. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's such an important message because people think, well, this is how I've lived all my life. It's too much for me to change now. I can't change now. And you can, you just have to make that choice and that decision. Is there anything that you would like to share or, or promote? Okay. So um, I have said that I have a website. It's mm -hmm. under the median.com and it will be listed in the show notes. And yes, my website is about living on not very much money or, or uh, paying off debt and uh, creating goals and um, living life with a spirit of joy and abundance on a budget. Yeah. All right. That is what it's about. But there are a lot, and I mean a lot of things on that website that deal with food because food is one of the areas of your budget that you can really save money on. So all of the recipes on there, Tuesday is recipe week. Um, one of our local um, organic farms actually sponsors the Tuesday Post. And um, so I do all kinds of information, recipe ideas for using fresh 
food as the basis of your weekly menu plan and saving money. So that is on there on Tuesdays. So if you go to the website, you can, there's a, a link for CSAs and you'll find all the posts like listed under it. Um, there's also what I call $50 weeks, $50 menus. So mm -hmm. my $50 menu posts are how I show how I feed my family a whole food plant-based diet on just $50 a week. Now, wow. do I do that all the time? No, I do not. But I can. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it for $50 a week when I need to. Mm -hmm. And so I, there are a lot of photos, a lot of recipe links. I show exactly what I made for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks for an entire week. And it was no more than $50. I total everything up at the end and show you that it was $50. Wow. Uh, so that's on there too. Um, so yeah, go check out the website. And I actually have a free ebook that I offer. And there'll be a link for this also in the show notes. Yeah. And I think you'll actually find it really helpful. If you're looking at veganism, it's a 30-minute quick and easy menu planning, weekly menu planning. And I show how I put together basically a menu based on things that I already have in my house and you can do it in about 30 minutes. Wow. Yeah. These sound like, like great resources and great tips and especially having it fresh, right? Because I think so often people think of being affordable and cheap, meaning that you have to opt for canned, frozen, uh, you know, yeah. the discounted, uh, boxes of, of processed stuff, right? Like they don't picture fresh as being affordable. So that's, that's really amazing that you're, you're showing people how to do that. Thanks. I hope everybody will check it out. Yes. So, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, please go on and check out, uh, Hope's website under the median and get some tips. Um, if you're watching this and you want to join me and talk a bit about your vegan journey, reach out and I'd love to connect with you. So uh, thanks again, Hope, and we'll talk to you again soon. Hey, thanks, Morgan. It's been fun. Thank you again to Hope for joining us and thank you for watching. Be sure to go and check out Hope's uh, YouTube channel. That's in the description along with her website and her freebie that she mentioned. So you can grab all that below and don't forget to hit like on this video and subscribe. Thanks. Talk to you again soon. Bye.